Our next speaker is Arthur Yarosevich from uh, UCLA, from uh, Jason Ernst's lab, and he'll be talking about uh, fine mapping of chromatin interactions. What's that? Um, no, no, I was going to use it. You've got the adapter. I have the adapter. Yes, I'm sure what this one doesn't. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Arthur. I'm in Jason Ernst's lab. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about high c which is one thing we haven't talked about yet today. We did talk about it a lot yesterday and in the previous sessions. But um, So quick, very, very, very quick recap of high c since I'm sure most of you are familiar with it already. Uh, high c measures the 3D conformation of the genome. So if you have a skin cell and you extract the DNA, It'll have this tangled structure. Hi C measures these interactions right here, where you have two pieces of DNA that are close to each other, uh, close to each other in three dimensions. Uh, this is followed by paradigm sequencing. After you map it back to the genome, you can generate a contact matrix like this. So the way you read this contact matrix is if you want to find the um, how often two regions interact with each other you go to these two positions in the matrix. So if you want to find uh, how often 221.6 megabases interact with 222.4 megabases, you just find the corresponding spot on the, uh, the, the matrix right here. And it'll just be the intensity of the value there. Right, so of course, more red means more contact, less red means less contact. Now, uh, the way we interpret these high C matrices is in two different ways. So, a lot of people look at TADs, which is what most of the talks have been over the past few days. And what a TAD is, is it's a contiguous genomic region where everything is in higher contact than expected by chance. Uh, so we have a TAD here, and you also see a TAD right here. Uh, but what I'm more interested in is peaks. So what peaks are is there are pairs of regions that are enriched compared to some sort of background. Uh, it could either be a two-dimensional background or a one-dimensional background. I won't go into much of the details. but. Uh, so you can see a peak right there, you'll see a peak right there, and you'll see a peak right there. And these can be within TADs, on the corners of TADs, or totally outside of TADs. Now, why do we care about these peaks? Um, they've been found to bring together regulatory elements, uh, such as promoters, enhancers, repressors, and so forth. Um, unfortunately, because of the really, really coarse resolution of high c it's very difficult to figure out the exact interacting elements. These peaks tend to be anywhere between 5 kb to 50 kb or more. Um, there's only been one map generated so far that has 5 kb peaks, and even these are incredibly noisy. So generally speaking, you want to call them anywhere between 10 and 50 kb. Um, just as an example, here I have two tracks, two positions in the genome. Each of these is 25 kb. Um, and I drew a little cartoon here where you have enhancers in yellow, promoters in red. And I hope you notice how difficult it is to interpret what's happening in this interaction. Is this CTCF site interacting with one of these other CTCF sites or maybe a promoter? Maybe this promoter here on the bottom is being enhanced. Or maybe this promoter is being repressed. We don't really know. So our goal here is, given two broad interacting regions, can we determine the precise interacting elements? Uh, one way we could approach this is by increasing resolution directly. Unfortunately, because high C generates a 2D matrix, uh, this becomes very expensive. So increasing the resolution by a factor of 10 increases the cost by a factor of 100. Additionally, as I mentioned before, these peaks uh, are very, very noisy. So calling peaks at anything less than 5 kb is essentially randomly guessing. Um, and I hope you appreciate here, 
the difference between this peak right here and this peak right here by eye doesn't look very different. You, I, there may be some very fine scale differences there, but it doesn't really look much sharper. Um, another method that you could potentially use is leveraging existing maps to increase resolution computationally. So um, one of these methods is high c plus. And what high c plus does is it leverages maps from other cell types to increase the resolution in a given cell type. Unfortunately, uh, they've only generated maps as fine as 10 KB, and it's not clear how we can increase it further. So how can we increase resolution cheaply? Well, we can leverage epigenomic data, or ChIP-seq and DNAs. It's much finer resolution, so uh, resolution is anywhere between 50 and 100 base pairs. It's much cheaper to sequence. We have many imputed marks for the robot roadmap consortium, either from Chrome Impute or Predicted, and it can give us insight to function of contact. So this is my method. It's called CHI-SCAN. It stands for Chromatin Interaction Siamese Convolutional Neural Net, and I'll explain what the Siamese Convolutional Neural Net is. So the basic workflow here is we run a low-resolution high c experiment. We call coarse peaks, and it's very important that we say coarse peaks, so anywhere between 10 KB and 50 KB. Uh, we can use two different types of peak colors here. I look at both hiccups and high c dc, although most of the analysis here are going to be with hiccups. And finally, we use chip seek and DNAs to infer the high resolution peaks. So essentially what we want to do is we want to narrow it down to two positions. Okay, so what does the data look like? So we take our two interacting regions. Remember, these peaks are two interacting regions, not one contiguous region, but two. Um, you have locus A on the left and locus B on the right. Let's say they're 25 KB. We split these into 100 base pair windows. Then we start generating our matrix. And our matrix is composed of ChIP-seq for histone marks, uh, transcription factors if you have them, and DNAs. Now remember, we don't actually need to have all these transcription factors, right? We, do, we can just use imputed marks. And we're answering the question, which subregions are the most important? So which of these windows is most important? So this is what the training data looks like. So, each sample here is a pair of matrices. So A1, B1, you can consider that one peak. A2, B2 is the second peak. And for your negative samples, one thing you could do is just randomly sample two positions in the genome, somehow controlled for distance. Uh, this is what I call the genomic background. What this does is it allows us to answer the question, what distinguishes a peak from a non-peak? Another question we could ask is, how do we determine the specificity of the interaction? And what we can do here is we can hold the left side of the peak constant and shuffle the right. We shuffle it so that no locus is with its original mate. So what this should do is it should help us answer the question, what distinguishes this particular peak from other peaks? Um, it is kind of a very weird background, so just to give you a little bit of intuition why we want to do this, if you imagine that every single peak is driven by CTCF, then it becomes almost a trivial problem, almost. But in the shuffled background, if every single one of these pe peaks is driven by CTCF, then CTCF becomes totally unimportant, so you have to rely on other types of features, true pairwise signal. Okay, so that's the data. Now, let's talk about the model. So this is a Siamese convolutional neural net. It's called Siamese because it has two identical subnetworks that are later joined on top. So uh, we have these two data matrices. They're passed through an encoder, which is essentially a way to reduce the dimensionality. Then a convolutional layer, which enforces translation invariance. Then a max pooling layer, this also as a side note, allows for different size inputs, which I can talk about later if someone asks me about it, um, followed by two dense layers and a regression layer. All right. So how good is this model at distinguishing peaks from non-peaks? 
Well, so the red curve here corresponds to the error into the ROC when using a genomic background. The blue is the shuffled background. On the left, I have the performance on the Hiccups Peaks, which come from Rao et al's paper. These are very conservative, um, easily reproducible peaks. And on the right, we have peaks from High CDC, uh, which comes from Christina Leslie's lab. It's very similar to Fit High C for those of you that are familiar with it from, from Bill Noble's group. Um, these are much more sensitive, much more difficult to reproduce, but uh, from what I've seen, it seems to pick up more functional interactions, or a higher number of functional interactions. Okay, so we have this model, we've trained this model, um, and what do we do with it? We're not trying to predict peaks. We already have our peaks. What we're trying to do is we're trying to interpret these peaks. So we want to answer the question, why are these two regions interacting? So what we do is we take our model and each data point, which is a peak, and we use integrated gradients or deep lift to analyze the peak. And this is a, essentially a feature importance method. So it's applied in machine vision to highlight pixels that are most important to an image. So in the top image here, you see a picture of a camera. We may want to answer the question, why is the neural net predicting that this is a camera? It may be obvious to us, but if it suddenly predicts that it's a camel, we also want to know why it's predicting that it's a camel. Um, so what it'll do is it'll highlight individual pixels here and blur out the background. It'll, it'll kind of push it into the background, mask it off. So the equivalent here is we have this pair of matrices. And what integrated gradients or deep lift does is it highlights individual cells, which are important to the prediction. And what we can do with these importances is we can then sum them up for the entire column and get a track. So on the very bottom in gray, you'll see these are the feature importances. These are just values that somehow contribute to the prediction. OK, so what does this look like? So if we take two regions, so this corresponds to one peak, we come up with these beautiful tracks. And you see a very, very sharp peak here on each side. So the, these two peaks correspond very nicely to CTCF, so it seems like it's working. Um, the CTCF track right here is in blue. You'll notice that there's a very sharp peak there. And you may notice that there are multiple peaks throughout each region, um, and it does a very good job at just predicting one. It doesn't sort of split the difference necessarily. So it's not just CTCF driven, I would say. Uh, how do we know this is working? So one way you could validate this is by going back to the original peak calls. So one thing that I did not mention is that in the original paper, Rao et al. called peaks at three different resolutions in K562 depending on the statistical significance. So if it was a very statistically significant um, interaction at 5 KB, they would call it at 5 KB. But if it wasn't significant enough, they would try 10 KB, and if not, they would try 25 KB. But they reported all three of these simultaneously. So there would be one peak set with three different resolutions combined. So what we did when we trained is we took all these peaks and we extended them to 25 KB. Now the question is, can we recover the original 5 KB peaks after they've been extended and trained on? Hopefully. So very simple way to do this. If you imagine this is the 5 KB peak in the middle and the 25 KB uh, region surrounding it, we want to figure out how likely it is that, we're gonna, that our prediction is going to fall in the center. So this is our first peak. We happen to fall in the original 5 KB peak both on the left and on the right. For our second peak, we managed to hit on the left but miss on the right. The third one, we miss both. And we keep doing this. So how often do we fall in the middle peak? It turns out really, really well. Very, very often, I mean. So these are the 5 KB peaks. We see an excellent enrichment for the very center. Uh, it's about seven and a half fold. One thing that you may notice is there also is a little bit of bleed around the sides. Um, I think this may be due to uh, potentially miscalling peaks. So if you're trying to call at 5 KB resolution, imagine the, the true peak is right on the boundary. 
it could be very easy to pick up one or the other pixel. Uh, the way they originally call this is they just take the pixel with a maximum intensity in some neighborhood. If you look at peaks that were originally 10 KB, you do also see an enrichment pattern, but it's of course not as strong. And if everything's working accordingly, the 25 KB peaks should have no very obvious sign of enrichment. Okay, cool. So we talked about the genomic background. What about the shuffled background? So these were the original predictions for using a genomic background. Remember, we had this CTCF being picked up. These are the scores for the genomic background. You'll see that the left corresponds to some sort of strong enhancer and the right to an actively transcribed region. Um, now this is a little bit difficult to validate because there is no ground truth, and if any of you have any fantastic idea as to how to validate this, that would be very cool. Um, but for now, all I can really do is describe the sorts of interactions that it picks up. So to do this, I looked at the relative enrichments of predictions using a genomic background versus a shuffled background. So what you see in this heat map is different Chrome HMM states. <clears throat> So you see trans, uh, transcription start sites, you see promoters, you see enhancers, CTCF sites, repressive sites on the bottom. So this corresponds to the left region and this corresponds to the right region. So the blue corresponds to more enriched in the genomic background or compared to the genomic background. So if we use the genomic background, we see many pairs of CTCF sites, promoters, and TSSs. And if we train using the shuffled background, we see many more repressive sites, DNA sites, and enhancer elements. So what I think this is picking up is it's picking up uh, pairs of repressive sites and pairs of active sites. So it could be a useful way of predicting the type of the interaction. Um, lastly, we do see enrichments for CTCF, a very strong enrichment for CTCF no matter what peak color you use, if it's um, high C, DC, or hiccups. And we do see uh, moderate enrichment for conserved bases. The SNPs and the EQTLs, it's still a little bit of a unsure which way they should be enriched and, well, whether or not they should be enriched. So to wrap up, what I'm saying we should do is instead of uh, generating uh, very deep, deeply sequenced high C maps, we should be generating coarse high C maps and calling coarse peaks and then imputing the rest. This is, however, very dependent on the peak caller. So um, different peak callers will pick, pick up different types of information. Uh, so really you need to answer for yourself, what kind of interactions am I looking for? Secondly, the background is important here. So what background should you use? If you use a genomic background, you should be able to pick, pick, uh, pick up the peak position very nicely. And if you use a shuffled background, it'll give you some idea as to what that interaction is about, what sort of function it's giving you. Um, and before anyone asks, yes, this can be applied to other types of C technology. Um, if you guys want to talk about this any further, I'll be at my poster B706 in about 40 minutes. So I hope to see you there. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of ISMB and ISCB, uh, my PI, Jason Ernst, and the whole lab. Um, lastly, Anshul Kondaji, I don't think he's here, but I'd like to thank him and his lab greatly, um, and Merv Sahin from Christina Leslie's lab for running all these peaks. Thank you. Very interesting work and a very clear presentation. Um, so I have a question about the comment you made at the end. So you said uh, we should generate a coarse high C data, but do you think that uh, if you have a deeply deep, uh, sequenced high C data, you can actually improve the performance of uh, peak colors so that uh, when it's integrated with your method, you can generate better results? Yes. So that is that is a big big point. So peak callers uh, right now, I'm, I'm calling upon the community to really think very deeply about peak callers. Um, I think largely high c has a fundamental uh, limit in terms of resolution. 
I don't, I don't actually think that doing very, very deeply sequenced maps can give us much better ideas of where the peaks are. Uh, these peaks are very, they tend to be very diffuse anyway. And when you have such strong spatial correlation, I think no matter how deep you go, it becomes very difficult to disambiguate two peaks that would be very close to each other. I think we really do need to do some sort of functional interaction of this. Yeah, I, I think a functional interaction is important, but I think uh, improving high C is also important mm -hmm. because uh, we know that uh, the high C peak color so far um, has pretty low reproducibility across yes. replicates. Yeah. So I think that will uh, impair the results from your analysis. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you. One more question. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I guess a prediction from, um, from this work is that if you took a, one of the pairs and literally you're assuming this in the, that if you swapped out the, the region, like the, the local contacts of one site, mm -hmm. it would then stop interacting with the other site. But I would, I would argue that kind of from the literature, the expectation would be that actually any pair of convergently oriented bound CPCF motifs would, in fact, display a peak in a given cell type. And, that, and that's in part due to experimental depletion of things like cohesin, where that, that interaction is also completely dependent on the presence of cohesin in cell type. So do you have any sense of how to um, actually see if that shuffled control would indeed, in vivo, not lead to peaks? In vivo, it's a very interesting question because I mean this is ultimately a computational work and really, really more of an analysis than a prediction of what would happen. This is an analysis of what does happen. So I, I would say if you have interactions that are mutually repressive, then the epigenetic landscape is going to be different and there is going to be, those aren't arbitrary epigenetic landscapes, if that makes sense. So if you have like a, if you have two regions that are active versus two regions that are repressive, then it doesn't become equivalent whether you swap them or not. I, I think that's an assumption that it would, that it would be really good to test. Because mm -hmm. I think given that all the evidence suggests that if you put cohesin down, if there's CPCF there, you will get those peaks. So mm -hmm. sort of yeah, yeah. I, I would be tempted to. Well, let's talk about it later. <laughs> I think, uh